So it seems you took me up on my uh, invitation. So I'm glad that you're here. I'm thankful that you're here. Um, trying to just go ahead and just air some things out and get it handled with. Uh, so I invited you here to, uh, I'm trying to see, uh, you know, I gotta be careful how I word things, uh, to please explain or please share with me uh, what your grievance is with what I teach. Well, thank you, first of all. I, um, I'm right now in Madagascar setting up a few campaigns preaching here, so didn't know if I would make the live, but uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I guess on a personal level, it's just I think there's been some attacks that I don't think that you can, you know, find biblical grounds for that I'm demonic or um, have the spirit of Antichrist, you know. But I don't care about that. I think theology-wise, maybe it's more... Um, you, in your teaching, it seems that you kind of pit justice against love, that love and justice are kind of opposed to each other. That what I hear so often is that God is love, but God's justice kind of holds God back from being loving and acting according to his nature, you know. And that's kind of what was kind of my first impression with the video that I first responded to you, you know, when you talked okay. about Jesus loves you and having to explain that. So can I ask you then, what was your intention with that first video? What was your, like, in your mind, your best case scenario, what was your, what was your hope for my response to you? How would I have, how would I have needed to respond for that to not to go the way it did? Because the reason I responded the way I did is because your entire video, and not just to me, I think you look at comments, you can see that others would agree with me here, felt like you were taking a opening portion of my video and misrepresenting it. And this is why we said these things. The people I, were talk I was talking to, if you watched the whole video, which I'm sure you did, I made it clear in there that we teach Jesus loves you, but the world seems to think love is this soft thing of condoning you and making you happy. And we must explain and teach and show that love, right? Now, granted, you could disagree with that, but would you would you say that your initial video, the way that you represented yourself and the way that you represented me, did what you just said you were hoping to convey? I, I mean, I think so. Personally, I think that, you know, I do think that having to explain why Jesus loves us every single time and that you can't simply just say Jesus loves you, I think that... Well, that's not, of, my, that's not what my video said, though, Jacob. Remember, what did my video say? I just said that... Jesus loves you is not the gospel. I never said you can't say Jesus loves you. I said it doesn't replace the gospel. That was the point of my video, right? Because there are some Christians that will go out into the world and they, they don't want to talk about it. They'll just say, well, I went to the pride parade and I told them Jesus loves them. But did you say anything else? So nowhere in my video, and this is why people were upset with you and why I got upset. Nowhere in my video once did I ever say, don't say Jesus loves you. I said that does not replace the gospel. And I'm pretty confident that if we go back and watch that video, that's where my stance is at. Yeah, that's correct. And, and if you would watch my video, I actually agreed with you that you should explain the gospel too. I just, what I'm against, I guess, is just this, what seems to be um, you being reluctant simply in trusting that God is love in, in and by itself. See that I'm going to have to argue with you there, sir, or push back. I, you're, that's placing a little bit of words in my mouth. I've never been reluctant of saying Jesus loves you. Um, I go out into the streets and preach and I repeat the statement, Jesus loves you often. And, and this is again, why I invited you here because I wanna know what part of my video do you believe, so I can maybe not word it that way. Can you tell me what I said that would make you believe that I think saying, that I'm reluctant of saying Jesus loves you because that is something that a lot of commenters are now saying because of your video. I have people coming to me saying, just say Jesus loves you, bro. And as someone who confesses the love of Jesus daily, that's why I'm offended. So can you tell me what I said that conveys that I'm reluctant of saying it? Well, you did say that we should not say Jesus loves you without explaining what that means, did you not? Uh, a verbatim, I can't tell you exactly how I quoted it, but yes, my main message was just, just blatantly saying Jesus loves you benefits no one. That is my stance, yes. That, that's where I disagree. I mean, I would say that just speaking the name Jesus would be beneficial for a person. You know? And then you and I could have a conversation about that. And see, this is where the disagreement happens. And this is why videos back and forth struggle. Your first video, although that sounds like it's your intention, didn't come off that way. And it, you might not believe me on that, but we can we can both agree that, th that 
hundreds of people agree with me on that. Doesn't make it right, but that means perception wise, a hundred people plus said, yeah, you did not attempt to do that at all. Um, so I was not defending my stance at that point. If you pay attention to my early videos, I was asking you, dude, do you even disagree with me? Because in some comments you said, no, I agree with what Michael said, but here's where my disagreement's at. So to many of us, it felt like you were trying to cause a dis uh, 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 some type of back and forth, like you almost wanted it to happen. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, I mean, I don't think it's probably much deeper than that. I, I can remember doing another video that, you know, it, it runs deeper than that. I think it goes back to our theology, our view of God, maybe what, how you and I view the cross, you know, what happened on the cross. Um, I know. agree. So I, I, I so here's the truth. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you what I truly believe uh, I see here. And you can take this, uh, you know, I don't want you to take it the wrong way, but you know, I'm very blunt. It seems to me that you were aware of me before you made that first video. Let's be honest, a lot of us on TikTok, if we make content, we get aware of others' existence because people tag us and stuff and, you know, for use. It seems to me that this was just a low-hanging fruit opportunity to engage when you disagree with me off the rip. And this is why it comes off as you clipping a video that you technically agree with, but you don't agree with. And like you just said, well, there's a bigger, deeper thing right here when it comes to our theology. Not right now, bud. So, yeah. No, I mean, I, I can see that. And but so I'm, this I'm, is why I have a problem because, and I'm just going to tell you, Jacob, why my prop, where, where my problem is with you. I'm just be honest. You have yet to actually come to me directly in these videos theologically. Most of the videos that we've discussed have been, I mean, that I've seen, speaking about my tone, which I know about my tone, speaking about maybe how I present information, like how I talked about Jesus loves you saying I'm my own Pope, like, right. The, and again, you can have a reason behind this, but you have yet to actually make a video bringing up our true differences. So to me, it seems like you're trying to egg on a fight without actually saying these are where we disagree. You know, I, I've, I've, I've called you and we both say, I don't want to get the algorithm tripping, but I've said, get behind me, Satan, right? I have to be careful because the algorithm might think I'm harassing you or bullying you right now. They'll end the live stream. And I told you that the reason I say that is for an important reason. I want people to know if you're acting like an accuser, just like I would want someone to tell me, Mike, your fruits are bad, which is how I, how I am. That's my way of saying, I love you enough to say you're acting like this. Your response wasn't Mike. I disagree with you. Theological It was to start getting pettier. And two videos ago, you made a video about Dan McClellan, some other guy and me. And when I asked you why you made this video, you said, I've received many testimonies that this video has benefited them. Can you tell me how making a video showing me, Dan McClellan, and another guy, that's it? Who? Can you share with me one of the testimonies? You don't have to tell me their name. You don't have to tell me when they sent it. Can you share with me a testimony that was given to you of how it was beneficial that you made that video? I don't, I don't think we're on here to try to reconcile you and I personally here. I thought that you wanted to kind of see where you and I disagree or agree when it comes to theology. I want to get there too, but I would like to know first, at least like, cause listen, I'm gonna be honest. If we jump straight to theology, it's almost like I'm overlooking the things that we did prior. And I have to know, have you been playing this game to get to this point right here where we're at? Right. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to sound rude. The video is talking about I'm the new true, true Christian authority and I'm the this and uh, this, this. And here's this video of random people on TikTok. Is this where you wanted to be? Because we could have you could have just said, Mike, I want to talk about our theology. No, I mean, I, I did respond to you and I said that I'm open to talk to you. And but you had said at that point that you were done. And then I just happened to come across your live yesterday and here you are talking about me. So. You know, okay. You know what I mean? So is that I, when you is that when you first opened up the live stream? Yeah. Did you stay longer? I stayed for probably five minutes. So was the live stream about you, or did it, or did your name just get brought up in a group of people? I have no idea. I just okay. opened up the live stream and there did you I, are talking in the about video me. you shared. Did I insult you or say anything wrong whatsoever? Yeah, you did talk about trolls and Jacob and old Chewy and whatever. I mean. Did I insult you though? I'm asking you. I would apo I want to apologize if I insulted you. Did I insult you? I was definitely named among the group of trolls. I've so is that, do you feel insulted that I called you a troll? I mean, per 
I mean, you and I can agree that there's been insults coming from me and coming from you. I have not tried to personally insult you. So I'm asking you if I have, I will apologize if it's a personal insult. So was calling yeah, you a troll a personal insult? That saying that I preach another Jesus when I clearly <laughs> believe that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God. Jacob, I, mean, that is I would love to have that conversation with you, please. But my main focus right now is I just want to get the clarity on why you felt the need to put me, because listen to me, if I posted a video of you next to someone saying God has a penis and David was gay and compared you to those three people, would you not want to know why I put you next to those two people? I never compared you to those three, two people. So I then, that's, that's, so again, this is why I'm asking. Before we get to, we could talk theological differences. I want to know: Did I do something? Did I blaspheme God to be placed in a video with them two, or did I insult you, or were you just upset that I mentioned your name and you put me in a video with Dan McClellan and some other guy and said, "Look at my Christian for you"? I wouldn't say that you blaspheme God, but when you do say that someone who confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you can't say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, and then you go ahead and say that. I have the spirit of Antichrist, and I'm a demon. That so, is on the verge of blaspheming the Lord. Yes. So, uh, but, but you I didn't share that video. Lord. You didn't. Sh you okay. shared a video of me just talking in a live stream. And okay, so we're not going to get there. I just wanted to see if we could get there. So, as far as me saying you had the Antichrist spirit, and, and again, I don't want to fight, and I don't want. I don't want to insult you. You mentioned First John as the Antichrist, meaning someone who denies who Jesus is in the flesh. Absolutely. However, the Antichrist spirit is beyond just 1 John. It goes back even to the Old Testament when we see the foreshadowing of the desolate one. And fr from Revelation to Genesis, Genesis to Revelation, the Antichrist spirit elevates one above God. It's a selfishness. It's put myself above God. I am God. I am my own God, etc. And this is what we see throughout Scripture constantly. So the reason I said you were demonstrating the Antichrist spirit is because you chose to make a video where you just showed Dan McClellan, that guy, and me, and there was nothing beneficial for the kingdom. It was 100% for you. And you have yet to explain how that was beneficial for anybody. So my question for you is, are you willing to admit that you were in your emotions doing something just to let out your vengeance? Or what did I do wrong in that clip that you felt the need to share with everybody saying, Dan McClellan, this guy, and TCM? Well, first of all, you've said that you ended this. And then there you are in the live still talking about me. And I should also add that I by no means wanted to compare you with Dan McClellan. I have a huge beef with Dan McClellan and uh, the Jeremy guy, I can care less for him, really. I would never put you in the group of those people. Now, since I did a video where I'm scrolling through TikTok, I actually didn't mean to, I didn't even think about that. That could be, uh, you know, taken that way as you obviously did, so. Okay, so real quick, I just wanna share with you, uh, I hear what you're saying about the live stream. And this is why it is very important that I just challenge you on this, that you sit for a minute and listen, because if you if you actually watch the live stream when you were there and I posted the original clip, I was talking about being thankful to God and someone came in saying something rude regarding our situation. And you see me on live go, leave me alone. And I blocked them. And then I said, you know, I'm real thankful that God has allowed me to deal with people that have taught me to not worry about what people say to me. And then I named everyone I've ever dealt with. Well, not everyone, but I started naming people. I named Wade. I named uh, Chewy because I didn't know his name, the guy with the big beard, not you, the other one. And then I said, Jacob, I didn't insult you. I didn't say that idiot, Jacob, that devil. No, I said, I've learned from these men. You get what I'm saying? I've learned from my interactions with them. So again, this is that just like with the first video, you heard the opening. And I truly believe because of a disagreement with our theology, you saw low hanging fruit. Again, because of our disagreement in theology, you saw me live, you heard your name, you assumed Mike is attacking made a video. That's, I, look, you guys can think that Mike's angry and proud, but if you go back and watch my videos, uh, I get loud, I get firm, but I leave personal out of it. It's a, this is about doctrine, and I disagree with you about doctrine, yes. And from the get-go, I've been day one just saying, why are you misrepresenting me? Because that offends me to act like I'm reluctant to say Jesus loves you. I love the Lord thy God, and I know what that love is. The only reason I know God's love is because he died for me. Amen. Right. You both say amen to that. So you see why I'm trying to say that from the get go, you've attacked me like an enemy. So I never looked at you like someone trying to have a conversation. At least that's how I felt. Okay. No, I got it. And, uh, you know, I can apologize for anything. There's, I mean, certainly I, I made a video too, that there's certainly things that I've done wrong. You know, even things that I haven't probably don't even realize that I've done wrong. So, you know, okay. 
Well, then listen, I want to go ahead and if, if you have something that I teach that's improper uh, that you disagree with, by all means, this is an opportunity. This isn't a debate. So like if we disagree and I stay why I disagree and you say why you disagree, I'm not going to keep pushing on you. And I'm going to tell you that pushing on me, we're not, I don't want to keep going on one topic. We don't have a lot of time, but I'd love to just go ahead and air some things out uh, because again, um, you know, clearly, you know how I stand with your beliefs. I disagree with you completely. And I say things bold that some people get offended by. I think you feel the same way about me. I just don't think you're willing to say it. Um, I think you do think I'm a straight up heretic and apostate. I mean, you should, you should, I disagree with many things you believe in, but again, we'll get there. Um, so yes, since anything, what do I teach why, that? Why don't, why don't you begin with saying what, what is the cross for you? What happened at the cross? You know? What is the cross for me and what happened at the cross? Okay, so, well, that's a vague question and I can go down that path and teach sermons for hours on that. But because you mentioned earlier that you believe I say God is love, but I will take that as the uh, demonstration of discussing the cross. So the cross is the tool used by God for, for the redemption of mankind. And the cross is where the curse will be hung. And Jesus became a curse for us to be hung on the tree. He took the embodiment of our sin. Romans 8 says, he who... Uh, it says, um, he who, uh, man, I'm messing this up. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on saying that he became, uh, wow, I never have a mind blank like this. We both know Romans 8, though. Um, for, the righteous fulfillment of the law within us who walk not according by the flesh, but according to the spirit. Uh, oh, God did what the law weakened by flesh could not do by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's, sorry, I was having a moment. Um, so the cross is, the Son of God, the eternal Word of God, the eternal everlasting Son of God, taking on sinful flesh, he who knew no sin, bore my sin on the cross, taking my punishment in my place on my cross and erasing the legal demands, as it says in 1 Corinthians and also Colossians. And um, through his blood, we have sanctification, I mean, redemption and sanctification. Okay, so the only thing that we would disagree on there is Jesus being punished instead of us. I yes. would put it simply Jesus. Um, Jesus became a curse for us, you know, instead of instead of us. Um, and instead of saying that God punished Jesus instead of us, I would say that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That it's God the Father, God the Son on a mission together to rescue humanity. How? Um, I, would I would never pit God the Father against God the Son. Because... That's where I think the penal substitutionary theory goes wrong because it generates a schism between God the Father and God the Son where you have kind of a good, good cop, bad cop theology that God wants to punch someone, but instead of punching you and me, he punches Jesus instead. So he's punished instead of us. I would rather see the cross as God the Father and God the Son coming to rescue us, giving his life a ransom for us, and as he dies, he dies on our behalf. That's how I see the cross. I mean, I, I hear you. And um, like I said, we're not going to keep going back and forth, but I just want to, I'll do a quick rebuttal to that. And that is that I heard you say a few times what I want to see. And look, what I want to see is uh, probably the Mormon God. If it won't go off my flesh, I want, you know, several wives and I want all the lusts of the world because my flesh wants those things. We don't want anything with when it comes to God. If you really think about it, the natural man wants nothing to do with God. But what the word of God says is that Jesus is a propitiation. And I didn't invent that word. Uh, that word is written by the authors of the Bible. John uses it and Paul uses it. And that word means an appeasement of an angry God. We know that that cup of wrath has been getting filled up from the days of Jeremiah. Who will drink this cup of wrath? Jesus says, I will drink that cup of wrath. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. It says in Colossians that he erased the debts. He took that on. And, and constantly throughout scripture, it says he became like us to bear our sins. It, it says he bore our iniquities. Um, so I, I get what you're saying, but I would highly disagree with you and say everything about scripture co conflicts that. And I'm going to share with you something, um, that maybe you're not, you, you won't agree with. There are a lot of different attributes about God and God's love is one of them. Amen. It's beautiful, but he's not just love. And the problem with a carnal man is I don't think we can fully fathom everything God is because we can't reconcile it because you and I can't understand how to be loving and hateful at the same time, how to be just and, and justifier at the same time, how to be wrath and mercy at the same time. We have no ability to fathom it. 
And I truly believe that only by the Spirit of God can we truly understand the scriptures on how we can see in one breath, God says, I find no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but in the same breath, he says that the wicked laugh, uh, uh, gnash their teeth while the Lord laughs at them, for he knows their day is coming. We have to be able to say, how do these work? Mercy and, and, and wrath, right? And you, you describe all of God's love, but he didn't say, Jacob, I reveal my love and my wrath, but only share my love. Nowhere in scripture does it say, only share God's love. God's wrath is, matter of fact, the good news is good because of the bad news, Jacob. If there's no bad news, would you say that it's still good? No, I mean, I, I agree with you that there's definitely bad news, hence there's good news. I would, I just don't see propitiation the way that you see it. Um, there's definitely propitiation in the Bible, in our English Bible. And the word that was translated propitiation there is uh, hilasmus or hilasterion in First John and Romans 3 and 25, you know. And I think over the time, the, this idea of appeasement crept in when it came to atonement theology. Atonement meant originally at one meant. So in other words, Jesus is the hilasmus or hilasterion, which could also be translated the atoning sacrifice that makes us one, hence at one meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Greek, you have in the book of Hebrews, where you see the word hilasterion is actually translated the mercy seat. So when Romans 3.25 says that God displayed him as a hilasterion, the King James says as a propitiation, which carries the idea of appeasement of wrath, I read that as God displayed Jesus Christ as our mercy seat or as our okay. atoning sacrifice. And I don't interpret that as Jesus appeasing God the Father, Jesus conditioning God the Father to forgive. Jesus doesn't help God to forgive. God is able to forgive by himself, but that is how God forgives through the cross. Do you believe saying, that Jesus Christ is the eternal word, the almighty I am? Absolutely. Before okay, I, I just want to make sure because, you know, sometimes people use the language Jesus and God, and I know it's, we're just, you know, we're talking, we're finite, but I always like to verify when I, when it starts coming off a little bit of Jesus and God, to just make sure that we're actually there in, in an agreement there, at least that Jesus Christ is the incarnate Fully man, fully God, not God wearing a skin suit. You believe in the hypostatic union? Ab absolutely, yeah. Okay. I just, and the, just wanted to make sure that we have the difference there when it comes there. to. Uh, yeah, sorry, you're cutting in and out. I'm in Africa, I have bad Wi Fi, so if you can hear me, let me know. No, I hear you fine. I just wanted to make sure that we were. Uh, we were on the same page as far as who Jesus is, because that's the most important question, obviously. It must be a delay. Um, so, okay. So, uh, like I said, there's no point in continuing. We'll, we'll just keep going back to what disagreeing. So, we disagree on the atonement, and um, uh, uh, I believe in you know Jesus taking our place. You believe in Jesus. I would 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 this be a fair characterization? Uh, very similar to the Catholic view of a deposit of grace that Christ getting on the cross was a deposit of grace that you can go collect. Would it be safe to say that you align more so with their view of the atonement? Hey, Mike, can you hear me? I think yeah. I might have to switch my Wi-Fi unless, because you're cutting in and out. Would, I hear you, you said, fine. Would you say what? I was asking if you would, uh, would you say that it's safe to say you align more with the Catholic view of atonement, that Jesus' sacrifice was not a substitution, but rather a deposit of grace, and that we can then uh, withdraw from that deposit of grace? Yes, I don't hold to the once saved, always saved. Okay, so there we go. Well, I don't hold the once saved, always saved either, because that's that's a that's a TikTok doctrine that just says I said a prayer once and therefore I will never go to hell. So I believe in eternal security, but um, neither here nor there on how we word it semantics. Okay, so we disagree on the atonement. Anything, and we we disagree on eternal security. Anything else that you would like to uh, bring up at this moment? Well, I, I would disagree on one thing that you said there with. Um, the, uh, you mentioned the attributes of God and you mentioned love as being an attribute of God. That's absolutely not how I see it. I see love as God's essence, his character and his nature, and that everything flows out of who he is, which is love. So mercy, wrath, Is uh, he more grace, love than any other characteristic? All of that. I, I would say love is his nature, mercy, grace, wrath or attributes but love is essence 
Okay, can I just ask you for my own knowledge, at what part of scripture does his his uh, nature of love separate from his other other attributes? Like, where do you see in scripture where you can say, I see his love is his main attribute and the others are secondary? Can you tell me where that is? So it looks like he's dealing with internet. So we'll just give him a moment. Guys, for anybody just joining in, this is not a debate. This is why we're, I'm not pushing back at him. And I told him, don't push back. We're just going to state our cases. So guys, please don't come in here being rude. It's just Jacob stating what he believes. I state what I believe. We can rebut each other once. And then uh, we're trying to keep it as, as, as civil as that. Welcome back, Jacob. I figured you were fixing your internet. Oh, he disappeared again. Oh, he's back again. Jacob, we're not sure if we got you still. I think we may have lost Jacob. He might be trying to switch his Wi-Fi. We may have to reschedule this. Yeah. So it, it seems the internet might not work that well, Jacob. I really want you to hear me real quick so I can maybe talk to you about possibly rescheduling a conversation. Can you hear me? Yeah, it looks like we might have lost him. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, oh, are you back? Let's go down. So while we got you with a little bit of internet, Jacob, when are you coming back to the States? Um, no. Yeah, I left my hotel room. I don't know if the... Uh... It might work better. Um, I don't know if it will. We can try. Uh, but when do you return to the States? Yeah. I won't be back until October the 5th. Then uh, I got a few days in the USA and then I go to Canada to preach. Okay. Um, um, I can to go downstairs. Way. I'm in the hotel right now, and I can log log into the Wi-Fi downstairs. I mean, if you want to try that, or if you want, if you would like to, um, maybe if you would want, we could schedule something um, for October. Because again, I don't want you to rush around trying to get the internet, and then you finally get it, and then we run out of time. Because I don't have all the time in the world, and and I know that you're coming. Uh, you're probably about. I'm going to assume it's 9 p.m. there. Um, so. If you can't find stable internet, would you be will, uh, would you be down to maybe reschedule you, while you're in Africa, but maybe schedule an actual sit down? Um, is, well, it probably have to be when I come back home because we got two huge campaigns coming next week back to back for a whole week. So I'd be extremely busy, but it seems like the Wi-Fi is working better now. If not, we can do it when I come back okay, to the yeah. U.S. I mean, I'm down to have a little bit more of a conversation. Like I said, I got some stuff I'm doing today. I'm building uh, some stuff around the house and, and I've got work to do. Uh, but yeah, as long as you're still here, uh, then yeah, continue to have this conversation. Um, so you, 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 I asked you a, a question. I don't know if I got, if you answered, but I was asking where in scripture do you find uh, reasoning to say that God's main nature is love and the others are subordinate to it. Now, I might be wording that wrong, and if I did, uh, please reword it the right way. But it sounded as if you're saying, if we were to draw this out, God is love. That's his nature, his essence. That's what I think you said. And then things come from that. So therefore, subordinate, proceeding from. Um, where in Scripture do you get that? First John 4. First John 4? Because, yeah. because why? Because it says God is love. Yeah, God is love by nature. Yeah. Well, let's. I just want to read it. I want. I'm not. This isn't me pushing back because I disagree. I'm asking you. So, First John. I'm assuming First John, chapter four, verse eight. The one who does not love God does not. I mean, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Is that what you're leaning on? So your entire premise of the entire being of God, based on his entire revelation from Genesis to Revelation, where he reveals his attributes, 
you're saying that God is love and everything else is subordinate because first John chapter four, verse eight. You know, I wouldn't say everything is subordinate. You know, I mean, God is perfect in himself. He's one. But I do see as God being loved by nature. That is his very essence. And for example, you have Ephesians 3 that says that God has shown his great mercy to us because of love. So I see love as the essence of God. I want to make this clear that I'm not saying God's not love. For anybody that's joining in, I'm just asking why you decide to say that this is the uh, the essence and then everything goes below it. And well, not below it. Again, I don't want to misrepresent you, but my point yeah, is you, you separate his love from everything else. No, I, I would attach his love to everything. That's how I would word it. I would Equally? Say that he, huh? Equally? I would attach his love to everything. So I would say that his, when God, God is loved, therefore he loves, uh, therefore he acts justly. God is loved, therefore he pours out mercy. God is loved, therefore he can be angry with us. But everything that he does, he do, does out of who he is. So um, that's how I would put it. I... I Gotcha. What in scripture tells you that though? I mean, that is kind of the revelation of God revealed in Jesus Christ. God okay. Love for the well, world. I mean, Jesus did more than preach love. Jesus actually preached hellfire more than anyone else in the Bible. Yeah, but I, I mean, I don't separate hellfire or judgment to God's wrath from who he is. I don't separate that. Well, then now everything. we might be confused because earlier you said you had a problem when I say God loves and then I explain that that love is because his wrath is being poured out, but he offers you safety through his body in Christ and et cetera, et cetera. You said, I have a problem when people say God is love, but you don't like people saying anything other than God is love, it sounds like. So can you correct me here? Like, so why do you have a problem with that? But also, would you prefer also? No, uh, what I would have a problem with is where you kind of pit God's nature against his attributes. So when you say God is love, but that kind of sets, for example, justice or mercy or wrath against who God is by nature. Can you tell me an example of when I've ever pit, pit his natures against each other? Uh, pit God's you, don't, nature. you don't have to know the quote by heart, obviously, but can you just give me some type of example when I've done that? No, I mean, I haven't watched that many videos of you, so I couldn't probably, you know, tell you where, but I do think that the penal substitutionary atonement pit God the Father against God the Son, and I would probably think that you do hold to the penal substitutionary atonement theory. Yeah, no, I believe Jesus took my place on the cross, but that's neither here nor there. I'm talking about, because this kind of goes back to that first video. You have mentioned a few times, you know, reluctant to say love, God loves, but but I don't remember any time I've ever done that. So that's what I'm trying to say. Are you t are you using my face as your issue with some Christians who do that? Or, because I don't, that's what I'm asking you. What exactly about when I present the gospel, do I draw a distinction between his, his wrath and his love headbutting? Well, I mean, for example, just a few minutes ago in this, in this live, when we had a bad connection with the internet, you kind of sounded like you said that God is love, but he's also merciful. He's also this, he's also that. These are attributes. So you seem to separate God's nature and God's attributes and draw a distinction there. And I think that splits God from being one into being God is this, but God is also that. So God's love is, God is held back from being loving because he's also just. And I just don't see it. That's no offense, buddy, but that's your presuppositions. Cause here's what I hear, just being honest with you, because of how you view God, when I speak of his love and his, and his wrath, you think that therefore there's only enough room. But when I teach God, ask anybody that's been following me for the last year or two years, God isn't like me. He's absolute in all his things. He can be fully love and fully just, fully merciful and fully wrath. He, ha he doesn't have par parts to him. Our God doesn't have room to improve. So his love, if he loves, is absolute. There's no improvement. Would you say that God could be more merciful or more wrathful? No, they're full. His love, full. So therefore, he has full wrath and full love. We can't say, because I like God with his love, because love benefits me more, his love overpowers his wrath. No, it doesn't. God is absolute. He's not like you and me that can only do 50% here, 55% here. No, 
fully God, 100% God, right? So I don't preach God is love, but no, I say God is many things. God is a jealous God. God is a fire, a consuming fire. He is merciful. He is the Lord of shepherds. He is the King of kings, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Jireh. Like I can go down lists of names because God didn't decide to just say, I'm just this. So again, I'm not disagreeing that God is love, but it sounds like you only want that part of him. No. I mean, if, if you look at the Bible and read it, then you never see God is mercy. You do see that God is merciful, and that is an attribute. Or God is holiness. No, God is holy. God is justice. No, God is justice, what the Bible says. You do have, however, God is love. Okay, well, if we're going to be, if we're going to play the semantics game, Jacob, the word there that we see in 1 John 8, that love term isn't a feeling, so it's not like an emotion like you and I use, and I think we both know that. It's still just like describing someone as wrathful, because agape would be saying he's selfless, because true love is selfless love. So by God being agape, it's saying God is truly selfless at the greatest level there is. That's that's what that's saying. It's not saying God has cuddly, wuddly feelings for you, and God cares about you. Nothing in the Bible says God cares about you when it comes to his love. Now, does God care? Yes, I'm not saying... My point is God's love has nothing to do with caring. It has nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with who you are. He loved you before you existed. It has everything to do with who you were made to be, the image you're made in, right? So again, you're you're saying, hey, God's not these things. He's merciful. God's not mercy. He's merciful. You're right. God is not love either. He's the definition of love. He's selfless. God, to, by saying that, that's like new age. Love itself is God. No, love is not personal. Our God is not love because he is so loving. We call something love because it's everything God demonstrates. You would know nothing about what love is without God because that same book you're quoting, 1 John says, the only reason we know love is because he demonstrated for us on the cross. So without yeah, God I, demonstrating love, you wouldn't know what love is. No, I absolutely agree with you, but would you say God is wrath by nature? <laughs> God is wrathful, loving, merciful, all no, those I'm not, things. I'm not asking if he's wrathful, that he can be full of wrath or whatever. I'm asking if he is by nature wrath. Yes, he is. Okay. That's where we would disagree then. I would say I don't that believe, God, So does your God, God change? I would say this, that God chasten us because of who he is. No, no, no. I said, does your God change? No, it never changes. No, not at all. So, God is love by nature and never changes. So his his wrath is never. So explain to me then. <laughs> Your God never changes. And you don't like the fact that I said God is wrath. So when God poured out his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, was he wrath then? He wasn't wrath by nature, but he expressed wrath. And that wrath was an extension of who he is, which is love. So he wasn't wrath, and then he expresses wrath, and then he stops expressing wrath. So your God changes to, to punish with wrath? No, he never changes his nature. God is love, and everything that he does is an expression or an extension of love. Again, semantics. I'm not disagreeing with his love, but it seems like you're scared to admit that God is also just. Would you say God is just? Absolutely. But I wouldn't say God is justice by nature. God is wrath by nature. I would say God is love. And therefore, he acts justly. <laughs> J Jacob, uh, now I'm going to be now. Uh, now I'm going to say we're going to have to probably move past this because I think we're playing with semantics. So by saying God is love by nature, it's just using a fancy word again. That word means selfless, and the only reason God is selfless by nature is because He exists in three. Because the Father has eternally loved the Son, and the Son has eternally loved the Father. Because we haven't always existed, so His love for us isn't eternal. Because you know, that's not, we, he loved inside the Trinity for all eternity. Beautiful thing. The father loves the son, the son loves the father. So, but what you're doing is you're saying, well, God isn't just, but his justice comes from his love. Well, what you're saying is God's selflessness leads to everything else. Well, yes, obviously, but what you're doing is you're playing this word game saying it all begins at love. No, it all begins, it begins at God. And then things come from that. And we learn these things through God. But at the end of the day, what are you, what is your it sounds like you're arguing with me over semantics, but what does that change about the gospel? What does that change about what we're preaching? What What is exactly is it that we're trying to get to? I mean, love at the end of the day is a very reason for the gospel. And I think understanding who God is is extremely important because God has revealed himself in and through Jesus Christ. We agree there. And um, 
maybe I should just explain what I'm saying because I, you keep saying that it's semantics. I think this is a, a deeply rooted, I mean, it's deeply rooted in the Bible what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that God is not angry, though he can be angry. Or that God is not vengeance, though he can avenge, right? I'm saying these are attributes. These are expressions or extensions of who God is. So God loves us, therefore he chastens us. God is unchangeably loved. That's his essence, right? So in judgment, he is love. He judges people because he loves people or he wants to protect people. In vengeance, even he is love. For his, for, so for example, in Sodom and Gomorrah, that was in fact an extension of love. I agree. Again, you're not saying anything I disagree with. What does this all accumulate to? No, I, I'm saying you said in this live that love is an attribute. I wouldn't say no. I would say that is his nature. So here's what's happening. We both are ants discussing how the how God exists. We don't know what, first of all, we use words like attributes and nature based on our own existence. We don't know anything about God. Like, so again, you're arguing with me because while well, you're making his wrath and nature and his love and attribute, what I'm saying is God is all these things. He's not pieces. Like, that's what I'm saying. Do you disagree yeah. with that? Or do you believe his love is above everything else? No, me too. I think we just word it differently. Exactly, semantics. And I, I do think, however, that our understanding of justice varies. That's fine. So I, I think that is why you and I kind of sound right now like we're disagreeing, you know? Okay, I get it. But again, my point is, this all started because I said, hey guys, Jesus loves you is not the gospel, right? And I'm just trying to find out again, how, how do we solve this? How do we get to where we need to get to? Because I, I, this is this is a waste of time. I think you would agree too. You probably got important things to be doing right now. Yeah. No, I mean, could 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 you explain justice to me? Because that would be helpful to for me to understand where you're coming from. Justice in the cosmic sense, like no, God's I mean, justice. I mean, God's justice. Yeah. I mean, in short and simple, all all rights must be, I mean, all wrongs must be righted. Justice is blind. Justice shows no partiality. Uh, all sin must be punished. Okay. So that's where we disagree. I don't think God must punish sin. Okay. So yeah, we would have to 100% disagree on that. And I mean, that, that, I don't even know how we would even have that conversation uh, because God cannot have sin in his presence. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, you where can't even... Help? I mean, do you believe that Jesus is God? Ooh, yes, I believe Jesus is God. Did Jesus have sin in his presence? Jesus lessened himself and emptied himself out, Philippians 2. So Jesus' glory was limited. The only time Jesus' glory was actually shown was actually in, uh, at the transfiguration in which they couldn't even see his face. It shined so bright. And even then it wasn't fully revealed. God told Moses, if I showed you my true self, it would kill you. So Jesus made it clear no one has ever actually seen God. Only the son has, which is the lesson. He lessened himself to come into the world. No one can actually look upon God uh, or you would die. And that's what the Bible says. I got, I'm, Moses was yeah. told this. Yeah, but Jesus is also God, and he was obviously in the presence of sinful people. He lessened himself. Them, we agree on Philippians 2, them, right? Forgave them. I mean, how did, how did Jesus forgive the lame man? He didn't I sacrifice an animal. Quick, Jesus had not yet shed his blood for him. He didn't even confess his sin or repent. Jesus simply said, your sins are forgiven. Oh, well, that's, that that's Romans 3. Uh, Romans 3 made it clear that God overlooked sins with his divine foreknowledge so that he would be the just and the justifier. So although they should have been punished in the moment to be just, he allows to look over them because the cross will happen because Christ is the lamb slain because of uh, since eternity past. That's a that's a basic question. I'm, I'm confused. Are you setting something up? Or are you asking that because you don't believe that? No, I, I mean, I don't believe that God must punish sin. There's many examples in the Bible where God, as you said, overlooks sin. Only and, because uh, of the blood of Christ. Uh, oh, Jesus if Christ's said, blood wasn't spilled, would God still be able to overlook sin? What's that? If Christ's blood was never spilt, would God overlook sin then? Yeah, God, God overlooked sin before Jesus Christ died on the cross, yes. No, he didn't. No, he did not. That was Paul's preaching in Acts 17, for example. I'm sorry, Jacob, cross. when did Jesus die on the cross? About 2,000 years ago now. No, in eternity past. The lamb slain before eternity past. I declared the end from the beginning. Before Adam and Eve drew breath, Christ's blood had already been dropped, and that's why they didn't die. Yeah, no, I, I get that. 
but at some point you also have to say that Jesus did die 2,000 years ago because if he was slain before the foundations of the world in that sense that you take it, then there would be no need for Jesus to actually come and physically yeah. die on the cross. Uh, no, that's playing with the finite, saying that because God will do it, it never actually has to happen. No, the point is that God will do everything he says. Hebrews 6 says God is, cannot lie. So if God says before eternity, I will die for the sins of the world, it has to happen. This is why Jesus said, even if, if I, in John 5, he said, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is untrue. God just said, if I spoke for myself, it wouldn't be true. How can God say such thing? Because God cannot lie, and since he set the standard of witnesses, even Jesus fell within his own standard of witnesses. John chapter 5 said, I have three witnesses, John the baptizer, my father, and the works I do. So again, uh, yeah, no, sorry, going to have to disagree with you there. So with that logic of Jesus being slain before the foundations of the world, what was the need for Jesus to actually come and die physically? And what was the need for the sacrifices of the animals if God forgave on the basis of what Christ did? Okay. So if God sacrificed Jesus in eternity past, why did Jesus come? To fulfill what God said, because that would make God a liar if he didn't come. So that's answer number one. Answer number two, why the animal sacrifices? So this is beautiful. Hebrews 10 says the animal sacrifices for, were for a remembrance of our sins. Interesting Greek word there is anamnesa, only used one other time in the New Testament. And that's actually used when we talk about the Eucharist. Uh, saying, do this in anamne style, remembrance of me. So the old sacrifices were a foreshadow of Christ to reflect on our sins. The new sacrifice, we now reflect on our sin bearer. So, I mean, everything was a foreshadow type of Christ to prepare us for the way. Never forget the Passover. Jesus is your true Passover. Never forget the Sabbath. Jesus is your true Sabbath. Never forget the exile, or I mean, I'm sorry, the exercise, uh, the, um, wow, Exodus. Jesus is your true Exodus. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Jesus still has to fulfill what he says, but from eternity past, you think Adam and, wait, is people prior to Jesus, how are they saved? What do you believe? Well, I don't believe that they went to hell. I believe that they died and went to the grave. Okay. And, uh, you know, they were saved by faith in God. How though? by believing in God. For example, Abraham, he foresaw the day that Jesus would die. My question is, based on your stance, with Jesus dying in 2000 years, would you say everyone prior to Jesus was saved by faith, but they weren't covered by the blood of Christ? They were saved by faith, but wasn't covered by the blood of Christ. Did the blood of Christ save those in the Old Testament? Um, I, I'm, I really haven't worked that out yet how that works um can i recommend honest. go read romans 3 brother on your own this isn't me trying to be brother go read romans 3 again. i i do but because remember it says he overlooked these because of his divine forbearance so that he would be the just and the justifier right because if he overlooks them without christ coming he's unjust you let this sinner go free you're unjust god will never be unjust but if he punishes him, he's no longer the justifier. If they're saved by anything other than the blood of Christ, they're in heaven on their own merit. And you have to agree. If it's not by the blood of Christ, oh, then, no, yeah. so, I would never so, say that, so that Jesus can be the just and the justifier, Romans 3 says he overlooked those sins because of Christ's blood, so that he will be the just and the justifier. Abraham was saved by Jesus. Jesus says in John 8, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Yes. Yes. I would definitely say that. What, what I'm saying is, I re, it's just, I don't know how to explain this, but I guess salvation under the Old Testament, I'm not sure exactly how to work out heaven and hell and all of that with the resurrection, etc. I, I would say this. Oh, sorry. I didn't know you were still talking. The oh, delay okay. messes it up. I don't mean to cut you off. I do believe, like you said, that Abraham was saved by faith in Jesus Christ by seeing the day of the Lord. I do believe that. Amen. And so everyone is saved by Jesus Christ. He is amen. not come by the Father except by the Lord Jesus Christ. Impossible. Amen. Jesus is the way. Amen. So here's what I would say, just so you can understand where I come from. So in the Old Testament, I believe that the scriptures are clear that they went into the grave, like you said. And I think Jesus is the one who reveals to us that the grave has divisions when he shows us Hades and Abraham's bosom. When we read Peter and Jude, they mentioned Jesus going down and setting free captives and also preaching to those that were in rebellion. I truly yeah. believe that what we see in scripture is that God did not send his believers to Hades because of Christ's blood will come to save them. So they waited in Sheol. David said, rescue me from Sheol, my Lord. And when Christ died, I believe he went into the into Sheol, 
rescued his believers, brought them to heaven because he broke down the uh, death. And he also preached victory over the uh, fallen angels that are in chains saying, you lost. That's just where I stand there as far as that blood uh, atonement and, and the, how they were saved in the Old Testament. I also would point that faith. I would agree with you on the faith part because of Jesus' sermon. I'll oh, go ahead. Let me just say that I absolutely agree with what you said there. Fantastic. Okay. And then I would just say that in, in regards to faith of the Old Testament, I absolutely agree as well because of the fact that um, in the Nazareth sermon, Jesus actually points to two uh, pagan Gentiles for examples of true faith. He says in the days of leopards, there were many Israelite leopards, but God didn't save any of them except Naaman, who was a pagan. Yeah. And then he said it about the widow of Zarephath. So I believe Jesus was teaching it's always been about faith. Um, and, and when we look at the Old Testament, the law has never been to save. It's always been to guide those that God saves, just like Jesus gave us a law after he saves. Uh, G God set them free from, Israel, uh, from Egypt and then gave them a law. Right. So uh, law has never saved, always been trust God all the way back to the garden. Trust me. Don't touch that tree. Right. So it's always been trust God. Absolutely. I think it's you brought up something funny there because Jesus, I mean, the religious leaders were outraged of what Jesus said there. He brought up he wanted to throw off a cliff. And, and this widow and they were all pagans. He said everybody else. God didn't help them at all. <laughs> but they ended up being saved and healed. You know, there was many lepers. But only yes. one Syrian man, he was. And I would argue that that's a very strong faith alone passage right there. Yes, uh, you know, because and, and we, we didn't talk about the justification. But I will say this, though. I, I have enjoyed talking with you, but and I could talk for hours. But if I don't stop myself, I will talk for hours. And I have to go finish building a shelf and, and doing some work. Uh, plus, uh, just, you know, uh, I, I feel like we're at a good point here where there could be a future conversation. Um, I feel like, uh, uh, you know, some dialogue. <laughs> It seems it seems like you and I could probably have a great conversation when it comes to uh, when it comes to penal substitutionary atonement. We disagree, but when it comes to faith alone, grace alone, not by works, saved by Christ, all we would one hundred percent agree there. So that would be a very interesting conversation. Okay, well, how about this? I will make a deal with you now. Well, not a deal because you don't have to hold it up, though. But um, I will wait to hear from you on a on a reschedule, and I will stay clear from any content. Uh, involving you and saying things about you won't bring your name up. I, I won't say anything that may offend you as far as like these trolls. I'll try and be more cognizant of that. Um, but uh, 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 I will keep preaching what I preach, Bob. But I'm saying I will I will avoid that and we will uh, wait to see if we have a conversation. Perfect. I, I can do that. Like I said, I'm preaching two campaigns and two pastor seminars here in Madagascar right now, then heading to Italy and then going to Canada. So. Uh, uh, when I come back, I'll gladly talk to you about faith alone or, you know, God's grace. Uh, we only have minor differences there. I believe that, okay, I believe that you can have full assurance of your salvation, eternal security. Mm -hmm. But I still do believe that you can forfeit, um, that you're, you can actually lose your faith, but there's a minute chance that you can do so. So I would, be to, I would be willing to have a, a, a in-depth conversation with you because I have learned that there are many people that if you really dive deep, there is semantic issues there. But then again, there are also maybe doctrinal differences. So yes, I'm uh, I'm definitely uh, willing to have a sit-down conversation with you about that topic. Awesome. Awesome. And, well, uh, I will let you go, and I I will say that I pray that uh, uh, this was an edifying conversation for all, and that truth is revealed to all. Whether uh, you know I'm wrong, you're wrong, it doesn't matter. All men are liars. We just haven't figured out what we're wrong about yet, so we don't know what we're lying about. But God is true, uh, so therefore uh, let God be true. Anything that you guys have heard here today, I challenge you to check us both on Scripture and make sure that anything we may have said. Uh, um, uh, wasn't misrepresented or, or misquoted. And then for everybody that's here on this live stream, I'll probably hang out for like five or six more minutes just to take any more questions before I head outside to go finish working. Um, and if you have anything you wanted to say. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, Mike. I really do think that you were very generous here and very kind. And I do appreciate that.